First of all, thank you very much. And we have to appreciate the audience, which has now been through an enormously powerful experience. And it's decided to stay for the Q&A instead of hitting the bars. Um, my assumption is that you would much rather at this moment um, hit the bars. Um, and we all need a little bit of that. Uh, I want to ask John a little bit about um, John, what attracted you to this story? And um, I know more than almost anybody, I guess your wife is the one exception, how much of yourself you gave to this story. So why did you undertake this? And what did it mean to you to bring it to fruition? Uh, the answer to the question as to why I did this was initially resistance. Uh, I did not know growing up in a Jewish family at a reformed temple anything about the Warsaw Ghetto. I didn't know anything about resistance. I didn't know that the moniker, they went like sheep to the trains, was not true. Um, and on the journey, which took five years and was basically guided by Michael, uh, I learned an awful lot. It was incredibly humbling. And it reconstituted my identity as a person and as a Jew. Stephen, this is a story you've lived with your entire life. And in a very real sense, this was your mother's story and a lesser extent your father's story. But going through this, I hear echoes of lines that I've learned from your mother and father in all of this. Tell us a little bit about their experience and a little bit about what it was like to you to see this on the screen. First, uh, I just have to add my own thanks and awe to uh, John Avnet for having taken so much of what was, what happened, what was thought who was there and crafted it into a unit that is understandable and educatable. It educates others. I said that poorly, but it segs into the answer. If I were to have characterized what uh, sort of the, the family motto was in the Mead household, it was that there are witnesses, there are witnesses of the witnesses, and they are to train the witnesses of the witnesses of the witnesses. There was so much that was communicated here, so many lines of my mother that get incorporated in other characters speaking. I was thinking of the discussion, and now I already forget who the protagonists are, that are arguing about active ver versus spiritual resistance. Uh, I, I think it's Chernyakov who gets the lines about the spiritual uh, resistance. But that was for my mother, her greatest theme. It wasn't about the heroism of the ghetto fighters, that was indisputable. It was to understand that they were not the only exceptional resistors, that everybody living through that period, maintaining whatever little bit of dignity and humanity they could under extraordinary circumstances was both resisting and in many respects, as holy as anybody who was able to take up a gun. And uh, I just Michael, want to... Michael, could, could I add one thing? There's a little bit of your dad in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> because I spent time with your dad and, uh, and listened to him as I listened to your mom. And uh, as you know, your mom was one tough cookie. Mm -hmm. And uh, things had to be extremely accurate there was only one way, the right way. Uh, 
And your dad had a good sense of humor. And I'm not going to go into detail about his life during this uh, period of time, but it was but, but trying. But we, we have to say that, that the lines that struck me, uh, I want to go back, uh, the lines that struck me the most that uh, echoed Vlatka, is Vlatka turned to her husband and said, um, I'm going somewhere, I'm not sure I'm going to return. You can need my boyfriend because if I don't return, I want someone to care. And I think that was said in the cemetery where Ben yeah. was living. And the other one is, she is the one who taught me about the power of laughter. And uh, captured very, very well, because only a free person can laugh in the sense of stretching themselves out. <laughs> and doing all of that. And John, you captured that. And again, Film is, by its very nature, the particular. You know, I, I can write universal truths. He's got to describe it in the most vivid of all fashions. And one of the things John did brilliantly was to listen to the people who were there. Uh, and, you know, we had the experience. Tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with Kotsik, who ends up becoming a very important uh, figure in this um, movie well uh, one of the things that I have the extreme privilege and sometimes honor to do is to walk into people's lives usually very ignorant as I was in this case and then talk to them listen and learn and it's a, it's a it's as if I was a professional student which is good it's now not when I was in college or high school uh, and uh, so you, you have to perfect the art of listening. And in this case, people who had survived this experience were very, very loath to talk about it. Uh, Merrick Edelman rarely talked to anyone. I realized I was anointed when he finally talked to me. Uh, and it's understandable why. Uh, it, it, uh, it forces them to relive it. Uh, and, and that's incredibly, incredibly painful. So uh, it was, with Kajik, he was very, very skeptical. One, that I could actually make a movie. And two, that I could make a movie that when he sat next to me at the screening at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, he turned to me after the movie was over and said, my life's dream has been realized. The story of the ghetto fighters has been told. Uh, and if you knew Kajik, uh, he was not thick on praise, so this was as meaningful or more meaningful than anything I heard. Uh, I got a letter from your dad and your mom, a very complimentary letter, and I went, hmm, Vlatka approved this? <laughs> uh, more so, than she would ever admit. Right. So, and, and Kajik, when he came to uh, the set, which was like eight acres, and Michael was there. Michael was teaching the, the actors about the world because they had to portray. I didn't portray anybody. They had to portray these actors, these characters. And one of the things they had to portray, which Michael was talking about, was what were referred to as Jewish eyes or dead eyes. When you've seen enough butchery and savagery and death, you don't reflect light the same way. And for an actor to be able to do that is difficult. And there was one, I can't remember which reviewer said about Lili Sobieski. She caught the deadness of the soul that allowed her to do many of the things that her character did. Her character was a composite between Tosha Altman and Vlatka. Uh, and Kajik's character was just the opposite. I mean, he had a very, very positive outlook on life, except for when he showed up in the ghetto and said those words that he thought he was the last Jew in Warsaw. Uh, so it was a ride that started from massive distrust to a kind of friendship that is kind of indescribable and I think can only be earned from an experience like this. And Rita, um, I, I wanted to, Rita is a psychologist and Rita herself is a child of Warsaw Ghetto survivors. 
and uh, Rita and Stephen are going to be in a film that's going to be reduced, uh, that's going to be uh, released in the fall uh, called They Fought Back. But the most, um, I was just kidding, Rita and Stephen, whom I've known for a very long time, they've been married for almost 50 years, and they, uh, in this film, complete each other's sentences, um, which happens, especially not only 50 years, but uh, given uh, COVID, it's probably about 55 years by now. <laughs> Having said that, Rita, um, one of the very interesting things to look at in this film and in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising itself is the fact of how uh, much women were a real part of it and how much they were um, um, in there all together. And um, you've done work on... Well, I think that uh, women were quite underestimated always. And when the occasion came for them to show leadership... Hello, hello. Oh. By your mouth. Um, when the occasion came to show the kind of leadership and to participate, they took that, ch that chance, I think. Uh, um, uh, and they also were able to, to do something that the men couldn't do. They could pass. They weren't as uh, dangerous to the Nazis. They weren't dangerous to the Poles. And I think they, and that they gave them and some... they weren't circumcised. That's right. But... Which, but, meant, which meant, no, no, it, I mean, it, right. it meant essentially that they couldn't be betrayed if they That's had right. to take their clothes off, and that, that became an essential part of right. the role that women played in all of this. And also, a lot of the women had been in schools, in Polish schools. Jewish boys were sent to Hader, and they often had an accent and spoke Yiddish, and their Polish was not perfect. Jewish girls went to the public schools and learn to be more assimilated so it was easier for them to pass. And I learned something at this last conference which was interesting, that when men would walk on the street in Warsaw, it was considered unseemly. Men had to be at work or doing something in the country or farmers. Women could kind of go on walks and carry a basket which was a good cover-up for women. And, uh, and I think they took this role, and a lot of the women lost their families and had nothing more to lose. So they joined the resistance, uh, and they resisted in all kinds of ways. And one, one thing, one thing that might be helpful uh, to clarify, Rita and, and Michael, for any who don't know, there were 22 distinct groups in the ghetto. 22 groups, and it ranged from the communists and the Bund to the Beitar and in between, Hashomer and, and, and on and on and on. And one of the most difficult things, as you hear in the film, but I didn't go into great detail, is to get them unified. And many of them ultimately were unified, and there were two fighting groups, the Jewish Fighting Organization and the ZZW, uh, which is sort of... ZOW and ZZW. Yeah which were the sort of the parents of Beitar, if I have it right. Uh, and uh, so getting uh, well, people to agree. John, let me only, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jewish division, if you can't believe that Jews could unite in order to fight a common enemy and they, f they put two armies together that didn't necessarily communicate with each other, then you have to understand the consequences of the divisions among Jews. And, and here the consequences were that it took so long for them to unite as much as they did. And obviously it's a lesson for our world today and the things that we care about, uh, which is these divisions. And also the Orthodox would not participate. They believed that God would protect them and they died. Uh, so that was something, again, fairly relevant in my opinion. John, you did something um, which unfortunately echoes dramatically today more than, more than it did when you made the film, which is that in a very real sense um, throughout, he showed the power of propaganda. And um, uh, I mean, 
you could not have known then in your darkest imagination what a world today might look like. But tell us about the way in which you used it. Well, you're right. And uh, the, th the thing that I think is most frightening is the simple degradation of the meaning of words. And the fact that, you know, a simple lie that's catchy, it's pre-digestible, uh, can really mobilize a world. And when people would ask, how did the Germans do this? How could they be guilty of this? Uh, a lot of that had to do with the power of the propaganda and, and what's in the film from Goebbels is all true. I mean, it's right out of its words, its own words. In the same way that Stroop's story is, m much of it comes from the Stroop diaries, the diaries he kept during the, the battle, but it also comes from his conversations with Kazimierz Mokarski, a Polish patriot, uh, when they were in prison together. I mean, these are as literal as you can be, and sometimes they seem unbelievable. But then when you look today at denial of fact, a denial of things that happen, and distortion of reality, you can now look back in 1920s and early 30s and see how a people could be turned into a raging machine that killed in a heartless, grotesque, gruesome manner. So it's a, it's a terrifying process because it seems benign initially, and history has said it wasn't in this case. And one of the other things that I want to point the audience to is courage took many forms. And one of the wonderful portrayals here is the special uh, portrayal of Dr. Korchak. And um, we have to thank you for that. Uh, and for those of you who don't know it, Dr. Korchak was the equivalent of Mr. Rogers and Dr. Benjamin Spock in Polish culture. And uh, Stephen, why don't you tell us, because you grew up in a, in a, in a home where Korczak was... Uh, revered? Uh, revered, respected, admired, um, celebrated. The, the reverence of Korczak was not because he was a physician, but because he took as his job to be a humanist, particularly for children. And my mother describes, and sort of in my own head, I now use the imagery from the movie to visualize that final march of Korshak and the children from the orphanage in Warsaw, in the ghetto, the final march to the trains at the Umschlagplatz. As she describes it, she was silenced in awe, and everybody in Warsaw themselves watched silently as the children marched because they all understood the dignity and resistance of the way they were going to the trains. And the fact that Korchuk was offered a way out and mm -hmm. said, and what about the children? And when it was not the children, he went with the children to Treblinka knowing the end, but being with them until the end. And that takes a phenomenal amount of courage and the ultimate commitment of a physician to stay with his patient of a teacher who do that. By the way, there, there's a new PhD thesis that quoted something absolutely horrific, which is that a nurse was escorting um, her patients to the Umschlagplatz when they emptied out one of the hospitals. And the nurse said, uh, what do I do now? And uh, the German officer said, Korchak showed you the way. You know, Michael, there was uh, something, these kind of out-of-body experiences. Kazik was there, as was Merrick, for a bit of the filming. And, and Kazik was there when Korshak's children did the march. And uh, 
to see his face when we're shooting this. You know, it's a it's make believe, but it's history and it's true. Or as I say, when you make a film, it's verisimilitude. If you can capture the reality, it's not the same thing, but it can be similar. And if done well, extremely visceral. And the, one of the things that Kajik mentioned was the all the down feathers that were falling when the kids were marching out. And in a way, the kind of beauty of these feathers contrasted to, I can't understand. I can't even talk about it. But John, I want to ask you a film uh, question. Then we're going to turn over the audience, but I'm going to give you one admonition, which is it's got to be a question and not a speech. And I'm a nice person, but if you give a speech, I'm going to cut you right off. John, one of the things that I thought was fabulous in this film was the way in which you used music. And um, I thought it paced it fabulously, and I also loved the overture and the conclusion. Tell me um, how you used music in this film and, the, and the, the way in which it is used to pace a film in well, an incredible way. The, the violin concerto is the Brook Violin Concerto, which my father used to play on the radio. He was a violinist in New York. Uh, so it was a piece that I loved and, and love. Uh, and it's, to me, a quintessentially Jewish piece of music that's classical in nature. There are two primary composers. Maurice Jarre actually composed the music for the film. And Arvo Part, I used a lot of Arvo Part's music, who was a brilliant uh, composer. Uh, the, it, it was tricky because the material is so uh, delicate that if you put too much guidance in it with the music, it, uh, it feels fake. And the one thing you didn't want to do in a movie like this was to make it feel that it wasn't real. Uh, and one of the compositions that Maurice uh, wrote, it was really fun working with him in his studio in Switzerland, that was kind of nice, uh, was a piece called Feathers. And uh, this is a name he chose. Uh, but it had that quality of floating, these images. And uh, it, it was very, very, very effective. And, and part of it, was that it had to work with silence. You know, I had the unenviable task of trying to portray the unportrayable. How do you portray the trains? How do you, you know, portray the suffering? And so what I finally came to was just take all the sound out, watch the images, you know, watch them silently, watch them perhaps as you've never seen them before, um, and, and experience them bereft of guidance, bereft of an author telling you what to feel. Find your own way into what this experience is. And to me, that was the greatest way to create the horror. Let's take some questions from the audience, and I just uh, admonish you that it's questions. Yes. I'll do the second, last, and the first first. Uh, we, the Warsaw Ghetto didn't exist after the war. It was literally leveled. What you saw when Kaja came in Check. was pretty close to what he saw. Nothing, everything on, in flames. They, they decided to burn it down. They burned it to the ground. They literally. burned it to the ground. And so what I had to do was figure out how to recreate the ghetto a priori before, before all this carnage took place. And initially, I started working with Dick Silbert, who's a brilliant, brilliant co uh, production designer. And then I had to turn it over to uh, Benjamin Fernandez, who uh, is a Spanish production designer. And it, it's an eight-acre set, exterior set. It's, it's massive. Um, and we needed it 
to create a sense of reality for all sorts of visual reasons, but also for the actors portraying it. You know, as an actor walking onto that set, you know, you had to be able to see, feel, hear, and understand, again, viscerally, what the experience was like. Because if you were in the ghetto, after all that death, you know, when someone was dead on the sidewalk, you walked past them. I mean, one of the images that was very powerful was putting a newspaper on a naked woman and it just blows away. Uh, so it, it was a massive undertaking. It took months to do. The producer was Rafaela de Laurentiis. She's just brilliant. In Bratislava, Slovakia. We shot in Bratislava, we shot in Vienna, in, in the Austrian Alps, and, and in Warsaw. And a little bit in, uh, in Krakow, Krakow. Uh, anyway, uh, it was just massive. It was 74 days of shooting. Uh, the conditions were from winter to uh, summer. Uh, but I think everybody felt that the normal whining and egotistical nonsense that's part of all of our lives, and the film business is not immune to it, was not appropriate here. There was a purpose to what we were doing, and either do it or leave. So. And, and you know, you got, the, uh, it struck me again, you got very dignified performances um, by, you know, world-class actors, world-renowned actors, Donald Sutherland playing um, uh, Chernyakov gave it a peculiar stature. Uh, and then uh, John Voigt did a, a tremendous job in playing Strupp. Well, well, you know, one of the things with Chernyakov was, and especially as you get older, what could he have done? I mean, his arguments are so logical. They're almost like, you know, a, a syllogism. You know, they're logical, but they were wrong. But they're logical. What could he do? And, uh, you know, he did have enormous interest in the children. He wanted to do everything for the children. And that final betrayal was a betrayal by a beast. You know, in terms of today, I haven't been there for 20 years. But when I was there, there was almost nothing. There were a few places where you could say this was meal 18. Uh, and there's this beautiful monument to the to the fighters. Well, uh, l let me, and let there's me, a celebration which Michael Let me on. add that uh, Poland and, you know, we have to thank the, the Talby Foundation for some of this. Number one, there is a major museum now called uh, Poland, which tells the story of the Jews of Poland. There's going to be added to it a museum on the ghetto uprising, the Warsaw ghetto uprising, which will tell the story of the uprising in one of the original Jewish hospitals which uh, played a role during the ghetto and before the war, etc. There's a remnant of the wall, and then there's a path which indicates all of these heroes, and the Umschlagplatz is marked. There's also a major monument to uh, the uprising um, that, was, uh, that was created, and for some god-unknown reason, the, uh, and there's a also a statue to uh, Jan Karski, which is adjacent to it. Karski was, uh, I'm going to say, was my very close friend. I taught with him at, at Georgetown University for years. Uh, I even spoke at his funeral, which is how close uh, we were. And he was the Polish courier. Vlatka, um, and you saw the, the map of Treblinka and its importance. And Steve, I, I want you to do one thing. Tell me how your mother pronounced dynamite, because you've got to hear this. Uh, it's one, one of the incredible stories. Here she is, a woman who's carried in dynamite, who's carried dynamite and jumped walls. And how did she pronounce dynamite? You know what? It brings up a separate thing, which is my mother never discussed within the house any of this. And I realized just this moment that I do not recall her saying the word dynamite. It's written, but that is a striking thing. So I, if you I, could help I, me. I do, I do in her testimony, and I've seen her testimony in, in three different forms. In her testimony, it's dynamite. 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 And it takes... 
It takes you a couple of moments to realize, but she's speaking English. It takes you a couple of real moments to realize that she's describing dynamite, and you have a, a, a woman, and, and you know, uh, uh, the woman who played uh, this uh, uh, had, uh, your, your mother was slight. It looked, uh, on, a, on a good day, it looked like you could uh, blow her over, but she was slight, but never to be underestimated and tough as nails. Uh, can, can I ask, just finish one, one thing, that just in terms of what he said, which is, uh, the, uh, there's a rabbi, Michael Shudrich in Warsaw, who's been ministering for many, many years, uh, and he's been one of the forces in terms of building up the population, which is still quite small, but it's, you know, it's, he, he has been a pivotal spiritual figure. I just would like to add that uh, I was in Warsaw in 1957 as a child, and I remember standing in front of the debris of the Warsaw Ghetto, which was about two feet off the ground of the city for miles and miles and miles. And uh, that was what the ghetto had become, just an endless field of debris. And uh, today, of course, it's not that. There are projects on it, and there's all these historical monuments. But for many, many years, it was just a, a field of rubble. And they're excavating. Um, there's a new form of archaeology. Um, which is non-disruptive. They use um, essentially um, radar and magnetism to be able to portray what is underneath before you dig. And they have now, under the late Richard Freund, they've now done a number of excavations. And in fact, there is uh, going to be an excavation um, in the spring to try to find the third milk can of Ringelblum uh, because it was rumored to have been in the Chine on the grounds of the Chinese embassy and the Chinese were not allowed, uh, allowing people to excavate there. But it now appears to be that it's in a park across the street. So there will be, uh, because the addresses have changed. Mill 18 is a mound and Miller 18 is also about to be um, don't, with ground penetrating radar and sonar sounds and like is about to be excavated so we may know, know more about that as well. Let's take a couple of more questions. Roberta. It's based on uh, a, a Jewish policeman named Kalel Wasser. The question was, was the Jewish policeman in the film based on a, uh, a, a true character, and uh, it's largely based on his story and his turnaround, uh, but it's not 100% accurate. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, John, was this movie ever uh, shown in Poland and in Germany, and what was the reaction? Poland, it wasn't very good. Uh, <laughs> Not surprising. Uh, it, there was quite a bit of uh, negativity when it initially came out. Uh, and again, the film was released theatrically throughout the world, and it was on television in America. Uh, so yeah, there was a lot of noise because uh, it did not portray the Poles in the way they would like to portray themselves. I believe that the portrayal is somewhat kind uh, I believe it, it, there was a poem about that. I, I, I don't know how clear it was in the film, but on that Easter day that Lily Sobieski, Tosha's character, was walking to try and bring the dynamite, the dynamite into the ghetto, and the Schmaltzovniks, the blackmailers, Polish blackmailers, that was the term, Schmaltzovniks, uh, stopped her. You could see the artillery on the other side of the wall. This is the Aryan side of Warsaw, and you can see it firing away. And in fact, there was a, what's it called, uh, like a merry-go-round, like a the Ferris carousel, wheel. The carousel, the, 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 the carousel, Milos, yeah. the Milos, right. uh, so, poem. So there's a, there's a very famous poem about that. 
And the, you know, the Poles were going about their business. They were going to the movies. They were watching The Eternal Jew, uh, which was playing in Warsaw, by the way. Uh, and, that's, and that's why the eyes are so important. Well, there was a... Because, no, because understand this, that the population that had gotten used to this didn't pay attention to it and sort of block the whole experience out of their mind. Imagine taking your date to a merry-go-round, and this is the Milos poem. You take your date to a merry-go-round, and right across the wall, they're uh, setting the ghetto on fire. Now, that means you're not seeing, you're not paying attention, and you had to be careful that if you were Jewish and paid attention to what they had already taken for granted and discarded, you, your eyes could betray you. And that, I think, John did very, very well. But to understand it conceptually, you have to understand how much people had blocked out all that was happening. Also, you did it visually so magnificently. They're starving in the ghetto. And what's happening on the other side? All the colors, all the fruits, all the vegetables. Now, the Poles will tell you that they had a tough time there, uh, and they did. But comparison to the starvation thing, and he also got in in a way that you may not appreciate. 10% of the Warsaw Ghetto died in 1941 before there was any killing of starvation, malnutrition, disease, despair. 10,000 10, a month, right? 10, and, and the figure went up for the first uh, seven months of 1942. So it was a battle of attrition, and John suggested it. I mean, I give lectures on this stuff, but he showed it, which is much harder, and that's part of it. Any other questions? Any other questions back there? Last question. I'll tell you what, we have, I, I, I do this. We have two hands up. Let's take both questions. You get one answer. Okay. So let's take this gentleman first, and then you go up. You go up. Yeah, I, I wanted to. For the first time, I heard of, of of people not resisting and just going like like uh, cheap uh, to the to, to the gas chambers. But now I hear that there was resistance, and I'd like to find out where the resistance and how it was. Could you elaborate on that? Let's take the second question, and then we'll give you one answer. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Uh, thank you very much for, for a wonderful, uh, powerful movie. Uh, I wondered what are your thoughts and ideas about how the movie stays out there in sort of the Netflix catalog or any other sort of widely available uh, inventory of classical movies. Uh, is, would you like to see that? Do you, do you think that's a doable and possible and a good thing? It's available on Amazon right now. I mean, Warner Brothers holds the rights to it, but it's available so it can be screened. And one of the great things about the JPEF is they've been using it so wisely uh, to tell the story about this specific resistance. And again, there was many forms of resistance, armed resistance, many, many forms of resistance, as Merrick Edelman said in my opening remarks. Uh, so resistance was more the norm than not. It was the writers, perhaps out of shame after the Holocaust, admittedly an overwhelming, impenetrable event that couldn't be put into words. But perhaps there was pressure to try and explain it. And by doing it, in my opinion, just horribly implicating the Jews in their own genocide, which is absolutely not true. Michael? Steve? Uh, my mother, when she would lecture about her experiences with the Poles and with the Holocaust, in general with the ghetto, kept on emphasizing that for the people who were in it, getting through the day, surviving, was to them what was accessible as a form of resistance. The amount of effort that went into not dying 
being that 10,000, even when there were nobody, no, there was nobody being deported, 10,000 a month, a week, uh, dying. That was overwhelming, and people have to be able to imagine that something is going to happen before they're prepared to fight for it. And between the fact that the Nazis weren't telling anybody, were intentionally misleading, lying, a bit of that is, is depicted in the, in the movie, between that and people's hope that maybe if I just tough it out another day, we will get past this, that accounted for the fact that it took so long and it was so difficult for people to fight. They wanted to believe that we would just survive this. I just would like to add actually a quote from Vladka that she said that all Jewish children learned in school about the pharaohs and Haman and the pogroms and it was always a question of surviving through it. And so in the ghetto, they just thought initially, maybe it's another Haman. Let's wait it out. Let's stay human. Let's do the things for our children. Let's have schools. Let's have cultural things. So no one can conceive, and, and it's still hard to understand how they could have planned the final solution. It was just inconceivable. Um, May I uh, say let one me, last let thing, me, Michael? Uh, let me answer your question very briefly. Historians have distinguished four different types of resistance. Symbolic resistance, polemical resistance, and you saw that with all the publications of it, with the writing of even graffiti can be polemical resistance, the uh, underground newspapers, etc. Self-help, and remember uh, the, and, and by the way, one of the elements of self-help was smuggling. Jews could not have survived even the Warsaw Ghetto without that. And then finally you had armed resistance, but you had armed resistance in the ghettos, you had armed resistance in three of the death camps. And let me give you one phrase, just because Jews were powerless does not mean they were passive. Let me repeat that because I think it's, a, it's an important thing. Just because Jews were powerless does not mean they were passive. So, so Last thoughts, John? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I would be incredibly remiss if I just didn't uh, say that this film was made by the actors. And, you know, Hank Azaria, David Schwimmer, Lily Sobieski, you know, John Ailes, Ido Goldberg, Stephen Moyer, Carrie Elways, uh, they, they went there. They made it their mission to try to bring these people back to life, to make the story be something that could be told over and over and over again. And I just, you know, I, I hope you appreciate their work and their commitment. And, and again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.